So hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox or CCAST. My name is Carly Jewell. I am a conservation biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the at-risk species coordinator for CCAST. For anyone unfamiliar with CCAST, we are a platform to support peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing and the co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges, such as introduced aquatic species. And CCAST supports different communities of practice, including the non-native aquatic species community of practice that we launched back in May of 2020. And for anyone who would like more information on CCAST or our communities of practice, feel free to email myself, Christy Viner or Matt Graybob, and we'll go ahead and drop those, oh, thank you. Um, we already dropped those emails in the chat. Um, and so feel free to reach out to us. And with that, I will hand it over to Christy to talk a little bit more about today's webinar and introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, Carly. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Christy Miner, and I'm the coordinator for this non-native aquatic species community of practice here at CCAST. Um, today, we're very excited to host a presentation from Gregor Hamilton from the University of New Mexico, who will be talking about invasive crayfish impacts in the lower Colorado River Basin. Um, in 2020, COP members from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and state fish and wildlife agencies identified invasive crayfish and American bullfrog impacts and innovative control methods as research priorities and work together to select four projects that were funded by Fish and Wildlife Service science applications. So we'll be hosting webinars this year to discuss the outcomes of those selected projects. And today we're happy to host the first of those, um, Gregor. So Gregor is a PhD candidate who you can very soon start calling Dr. Hamilton, um, studying ecology at the University of New Mexico. His graduate Research has focused on the role and impacts of northern crayfish in the Gila. Gregor is also the co-manager of the University of New Mexico Savieta Field Station, adjunct faculty at Western New Mexico University, and co-coordinator of the Savieta Research Experience for Undergraduate Program. And just a final reminder, uh, like Carly said, if you have questions during the presentation, go ahead and enter those into the chat box and I'll relay them to our speaker after the presentation is, presentation is finished with whatever time we have left over. Uh, so with that, Gregor, I'll hand it over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much, Chrissy. I appreciate the introduction. So uh, today's presentation is a slightly modified version of my recent dissertation defense. So if you saw that, then you get to play the spot the difference game. Uh, and if you didn't, then I'm looking forward to sharing our work with you. Uh, so with that, I'll dive right into it. Um, crayfish, I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, are in the Southwest uh, US, but they're not native here. They're large bodied macroinvertebrate omnivores, and they're very influential members of communities where they occur. The large bodied uh, uh, trait is really important because they consume and repackage lots of resources. And so they're really important uh, links for energy transfer. Their omnivory is important because as consumers of detritus, they can help keep streams clean. As herbivores, they can uh, clear cut stream crops and as predators, they can regulate populations of other consumers in the stream. Um, they also act as bioturbators, which can increase the food available for filter feeders. Regardless of whether they're native or not, they tend to play a very big role in their communities where they reside. Now, invasive crayfish uh, have caused massive economic losses worldwide. They're a really big concern for wildlife and land managers. Uh, millions and millions of dollars have been spent trying to understand how to eradicate invasive crayfish, crayfish um, and it's simply not a feasible option uh, to date. Many attempts have been made in the Southwest alone, uh, and we found that the density can be reduced to some degree, but they can't be eradicated except for one very special case that we've heard about in Arizona. Um, one of the most significant of these invaders in uh, the Southwest is the Northern Crayfish. Uh, it's native uh, to the upper Mississippi River Basin and the Great Lakes region, as you see here. Um, and they've been introduced to most other major river basins in the US, including the Colorado River Basin, where there are no native crayfish. Now, Northern Crayfish are omnivores. They can live up to three years. Uh, there's evidence both for and against ontogenetic diet shifts in these crayfish, and that's when young crayfish are more carnivorous than the adult crayfish. Uh, 
So a crayfish population might occupy several different niches in a community at the same time. And as short-lived omnivores, they grow fast, and so they can consume a lot of biomass. Now, this is probably not news to anyone on this call, but Southwest River basins have a relatively low species richness and high rates of endemic species. Uh, so here we see this for fish um, uh, as an example. Um, that means that many of them are at risk for extinction, and many of these native aquatic organisms that are at risk for extinction are keystone species. Uh, they have disproportionately large impacts on their food webs relative to the biomass that they represent in that food web. So their extirpation from a community can have really broad reaching impacts um, and understanding whether and if so how crayfish affect sensitive and important aquatic community members, it comes up a lot in the literature. So for example, this is just a few of the reports and publications about one federally listed uh, species, the narrow-headed garter snake. Um, and all of these cite crayfish as a threat to the persistence of this snake. But while there's all this concern about the crayfish, there aren't actually many crayfish biologists working in the Southwest since we don't have any native crayfish here. And as such, we don't actually have very much data showing how or even if crayfish are negatively impacting their host communities in the Colorado River Basin. Since they could occupy any number of trophic positions as omnivores, um, they could also be simultaneously competing with the same taxa that they're predating upon. This is a process known as intraguild predation, and it really can muddy the water when you're trying to understand how an organism uh, fits into a food web. So we do know that the collective functioning of crayfish population can produce a serious ecological impact. We know this from many studies from across the world where crayfish are native um, or where they've invaded the system where there are native crayfish that they could negatively impact. Um, but Again, in the Colorado River Basin, there are no native crayfish, and so we don't really understand uh, their impacts here, how negative they are, or even if they're negative, when they're negative. But the goal of our work is to help provide biologists with some tools and some context to understand crayfish biology here in the Southwest, as well as understand the role of crayfish populations in a Southwest stream. So there are four overarching goals to the project that was funded. Um, and I'll discuss the last three in more detail today, the, and I'll give a brief summary of the first one uh, here now. So we first want to understand more about crayfish population and reproductive ecology. Um, as a result, we've published a methods paper oriented, uh, a methods oriented paper last August in aquatic conservation. Uh, our hope is that that'll be a really useful tool for conservation in the future. Uh, we evaluated carapace length and sex dependent mortality rates for three ventral pit tag insertion locations in a field experiment. Basically, we just wanted to uh, throw out there what is the best uh, way to tag crayfish uh, with the smallest available pit tag. Uh, this study was a precursor to another data set uh, that we hope to publish in the next year or so about crayfish spatial ecology. We tagged and monitored about 1,300 crayfish um, in sort of a side project with this, uh, all the work that I'm, that I'm gonna be showing you today. Uh, and I just wanna make sure I, I shout out to Taylor Cooper here. She was my field tech in 2021 was a co-author in this paper and she was invaluable in collecting uh, this massive data set. So thank you, Taylor. Okay, um, and also as a result of sort of, of our first goal of this, uh, this project uh, was another paper that we're writing that's uh, also a necessary first step for some subsequent analyses. Uh, but we also demonstrated in this paper that uh, a very simple method of estimating crayfish biomass uh, was equally effective as a more cumbersome industry standard that's used by crayfish biologists um, where they use uh, calipers. It takes a long time in the field especially um, and they measure to the 0.1 millimeter accuracy. Um, we know from working with fish biologists and herpetologists um, out in the field that crayfish are frequently collected as bycatch but they're rarely uh, life history data is rarely collected on them since either they're not trained to do so the biologists out there collecting fish or, or snakes aren't trained to collect uh, crayfish data, um, or they know how to and it's just too cumbersome and they don't want to take a caliper out with them, right? Um, and that makes a lot of sense. So this method is really simple and quick. It uses a tool already on hand by any biologist. That's a short ruler. Uh, and we have this paper uh, just about finished. We hope to submit it in the next month or so uh, to the Journal of Fish and Wildlife Management. Given the need for data on crayfish, we really hope that these first two papers will help increase the amount of data available for management. Um, and we really hope that managers with projects, ongoing projects uh, that collect crayfish's bycatch uh, will start implementing this. Uh, 
We also collected a lot of fecundity and reproductive stat, uh, state data that we plan to publish in the near future as well, since there's almost no crayfish life history data in the literature for the Southwest for crayfish in the Southwest. Okay. So now I'll briefly show you the, the three topics I'll talk about in more depth today. Um, these are the, the meaty studies, if you will. Uh, first, we used uh, inference from stable isotope analysis to answer several questions about crayfish ecology uh, in the Southwest. Next, we um, work to understand the influence of crayfish on key energy connections between the aquatic and riparian food webs, which are called lateral subsidies. And lastly, we worked, uh, we leveraged a rich long-term data set, uh, community abundance data set that was collected by Tom Turner, Dave Probst, uh, Keith Guido, James Whitney, and a whole slew of other people uh, to see if we could link uh, crayfish abundance with community structure and invertebrate abundance. Okay. So when thinking about how crayfish might fit into food webs, I'm talking specifically about their resource use and their trophic position. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna gloss over some of the methods and get to results a little more quickly. Uh, if you have questions about isotopes, uh, feel free to ask me at the end or send me an email. I'm really more than happy to chat. You'll probably regret asking me questions, um, but the gist of stable isotope question or isotope ecology uh, is that you really are actually made up of what you eat. Um, and this is why stable isotopes works for understanding resource use and trophic positions in a food web. The units that you'll see in a lot of these plots coming up on the X and Y axis here are called per mil units. They express the ratio of heavy to light isotopes uh, that comprise the tissue that we have sampled. So in a food web context with carbon-13, we can leverage the physiological differences in photosynthetic organisms to understand resource use. Uh, primary consumers then incorporate the carbon from these plants that they're eating, and they have a little bit of physiologically induced differences um, in that carbon ratio then that's incorporated into their own, own tissue, but largely it just reflects what the plant's ratios were. So using carbon, we can track resource use upwards through the food web. Nitrogen is a really good surrogate uh, for trophic position because it essentially bioaccumulates in organisms. So the, the nitrogen that was present in a primary producer is amplified in a primary consumer, is then amplified in a secondary consumer on up through the food web. So a tissue that we sample from a consumer can be analyzed for its carbon and nitrogen isotopic ratios. And that will reflect the average diet over the last few weeks, months, or years, depending on the speed that the tissue you sampled regenerates. Long story short, uh, you can analyze isotope ratios uh, for members of the food web that will then give you a good idea of who is eating whom in a system. Now, most food web studies only look at carbon and nitrogen, and they also look at far fewer taxa than we included. Um, so when you include more taxa, uh, you end up with a lot more overlap and, uh, and some, maybe some bad inference about who's actually potentially competing with who. So if you add a third isotope, in this case, hydrogen, uh, we can add a vital uh, additional clarity to our dietary niche descriptions. And so with hydrogen, the more uh, negative or the lighter the values of the hydrogen ratios in an organism, that indicates uh, more in-stream primary production use, while heavier or less negative values indicate terrestrial primary production resource use. Note that the scale is very different for hydrogen, uh, especially compared to carbon. Um, and this is really important to rem remember as we go forward when we're interpret interpreting the stable isotope uh, results that a biologically meaningful difference in carbon is something uh, greater than one per mil, but a biologically meaningful difference in hydrogen is something more like 10 per mil or greater. Okay, with that, we'll get into some of these questions here. Since our goal is to understand crayfish role, in this food web, uh, knowing whether crayfish occupy one or multiple dietary niches is, is an important first step. The jury's out about this topic. There is evidence both for and against niche partitioning in crayfish. Even in a single paper, they have evidence both for and against it. Um, this is especially uh, true when you're looking at young crayfish compared to adult crayfish, where the young crayfish are trying to bulk up quickly by eating a really high protein diet, um, so low carbon and nitrogen ratio diet, while older crayfish are more concerned with reproduction and they're content to scavenge and graze. There's not much evidence in the literature that crayfish diet differs by sex, but we had the data 
crayfish are sexually dimorphic. And so we feel like it was a question worth asking while we were at it. Um, so we did. So uh, we did this for all three isotopes. I'm just gonna use carbon here as an example for time's sake. Uh, when we look at whether crayfish diet differed by sex, we ended up having to include season, uh, partly because there were really large differences in the isotopes of crayfish depending on the season, uh, but also there were some unequal sample size uh, among some of our seasons and years. So we can see some of these differences here with carbon-13 as the example, uh, especially the male and female here in summer 2021, for example. We accounted for these seasonal differences as a random effect in mixed effects models for carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen, and we found no difference between males and females. Um, and it looks like there is a difference, but this is essentially because the difference between seasons among seasons was much greater than any differences we observed between males and females. Um, okay. And as far as crayfish diet by age, it does not differ uh, by age. And I know it looks like it might here, uh, but again, we need to keep in mind that that difference of 10 per mil over this whole range of carapace length for crayfish uh, is not actually that biologically significant. Since crayfish are short-lived and grow quickly, size is an excellent surrogate for age. So this carapace length uh, here is a really good surrogate for the age of the crayfish. Uh, and we can clearly see no difference in carbon and nitrogen um, and this hydrogen, while it looks significant, uh, is not biologically meaningful, but there might be something interesting happening physiologically with the crayfish, or there might be a really slight dietary difference. So this could be a cool uh, avenue for future research. Um, it's kind of unknown why that's happening. But when we looked at the overall, the overall crayfish niche, three-dimensional crayfish niche, uh, and tested for differences there due to size of the crayfish, there were no differences. So Moving forward, we're treating uh, all the crayfish as occupying a single niche, regardless of sex or age. Okay, so uh, next we wanna identify which organisms crayfish might potentially compete with in the system. Uh, we use isotopic niche overlap as an indicator of possible competition. And I wanna emphasize that it's important to remember that competition only occurs when resources are limited and that isotopic niche overlap that only indicates possible resource use overlap. And I'll explain with some orange fish and blue fish, which are kind of a staple of Turner Aquatic Conservation Lab diagrams here. So here we see two different species of fish, an orange fish and a blue fish, and their, their isotope values are five, whatever that means. And so we might conclude that they have really similar diets, but isotopic niche is a weighted average of what an organism has been eating over a period of time. And so while it looks like they are eating the same thing, they could actually, behind the scenes, unobserved by us, be eating very different things, right? But end up with the same average. So the stable isotope uh, values of a population could reflect similar averages just because, uh, and it could be due to them, in fact, eating similar diets or because the average of the different diets happens to be the same. Um, and I'll mention that adding hydrogen significantly decreases the chances of that accidental overlap and helps us whittle down our options. So another uh, important reason that we included hydrogen in this study. Okay, for these next three plots, I'll orient you quickly to what we're looking at. So we see a lot of taxa here. Um, I recognize that this is a lot to digest. And so I'm gonna try to make it easier by pointing out some of the more significant things. I included all these taxa partly because uh, I think these plots are pretty partly because we analyzed a huge data set and I can't just not show all of what we, we analyzed. It was a lot of work and time and I think it's pretty cool. Um, however, we're not really gonna focus in on every single taxa here necessarily as we move forward. So I'll, I'll highlight uh, what I want to pop out at you. On the x-axis, we're gonna have each isotope. So we'll start with carbon. Next, we'll look at nitrogen and lastly, hydrogen. Um, and I've color uh, coded the organisms based loosely on uh, a functional group or feeding guild that these organisms belong to uh, for reference. Um, also, these are all the, all the dots are the mean isotope value with the uh, uh, 25th and 75th percentile included here. So sometimes these means will fall outside of this. Uh, that's not an error. That's just a, a, a product of a skew in the data. Um, and just as a quick reference point, I've uh, put a bar here that corresponds to the crayfish uh, uh, niche. Okay, so for the carbon, we see the crayfish overlap with uh, someone from basically every consumer guild here. So we have overlap with scavengers and primary producers and in-stream and out-of-stream consumers. Uh, even one of the largest fish in the stream, the desert sucker, has a pretty large overlap with crayfish. 
So what this plot tells me is that there's not actually a lot of variation in carbon resource use in the system. Uh, and so we don't get a lot of discrimination from carbon. Okay, so now we have nitrogen. Uh, here we see a couple of really cool things. Firstly, I, I said earlier, nitrogen is a really good surrogate for trophic position. And here we see that shake out really well. So we see several trophic positions shake out where we have primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, quaternary consumers, shake out on pretty predictable levels. That's pretty cool. Uh, as far as what it means about the crayfish, uh, it looks, just looking at nitrogen, that they are secondary uh, consumers here. They fall out a lot with all these obligate insectivore uh, uh, insects. These are all insects that eat other insects here. Um, lastly, with hydrogen, uh, we see that no riparian consumers, first of all, overlap with crayfish. That's an interesting finding here. Um, and while far fewer organisms overlap with crayfish, uh, compared to the carbon resource use axis, we still see a lot of uh, different consumer guilds represented here. So um, we have uh, uh, scavengers and primary producer or primary consumers here, uh, and also some insectivores and some uh, and a fish as well. Okay, so those were helpful visualizations, but what did it really tell us? Um, it didn't really say a lot yet, right? Because putting it all together is a little complicated for our puny human brains, but. Uh, before I dive into something that is a little more digestible, I'm gonna make sure we understand the concept of niche overlap and a couple of important points relating to that. So put simply, niche overlap is the probability that a species, in this case, uh, species A will overlap with niche, will fall within the niche of another species, or species B in this case. And it's directional, right? So species A in this example uh, has a high degree of overlap with species B. Most of species A, uh, it falls within species B. Um, but the reverse order is not the same. We see about a 25% overlap or so with species B overlapping the species A. Uh, everything I'm going to show you in the next few slides will be the probability of crayfish falling within the niche of another species. So crayfish will be species A falling within species B in every analysis I show you. Um, and I'll reemphasize a point from earlier. Um, this niche overlap is highlighting potential competition. Uh, and I say potential because there are some cases that species will exhibit complete niche overlap, but are not competing. Uh, isotopic niche overlap, pardon me, but are not competing. Um, and uh, for competition to actually be taking place, there needs to be resource limitation. Um, so what we're looking for here is potential uh, for competition. Okay, and just another example here, we see species A nor species B have a high degree of overlap um, in either direction. So here we have on the left-hand side, this panel is just the two-dimensional isotopic niche overlap. So this is what most ecological studies would show you. Uh, here we have with hydrogen added. Um, these results, again, indicate the probability that a random crayfish will fall within a niche of one of these consumer species on the left here. Um, on the left, oh, and okay. So first I first wanna highlight some of the two-dimensional overlap. Um, so it looks like there are a lot of organisms that might potentially compete with crayfish when we're looking at just carbon nitrogen, right? And a lot of these look like insectivore uh, specialists. Um, and so they're either spiders, riparian spiders, uh, stream side spiders, or, um, or in-stream uh, insectivores. We also see Again, a primary consumer and an, a scavenger and the desert sucker, which we'll talk about in just a second. We had hydrogen and we feel very validated because including hydrogen knocked out a lot of the riffraff here and we're left with three putative competitors now. Uh, so now we can sort of dig into what we think is more plausible for crayfish role because one of the things we're really interested in here is not just who do crayfish compete with, but what are they acting like in this system? And so now we have it whittled down to they're acting like either this insectivore specialist, the predaceous diving beetle, uh, uh, the water scavenger beetle, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but it's, it's, uh, it's members of this uh, group uh, tend to specialize. They're a generalist population that tend to specialize. Uh, they have individuals that really like to eat different, very different things. And so they're acting like a really interesting organism in the stream. Desert suckers, uh, act like vacuum cleaners and they go around slurping up algal mats that actually have lots of insects and algae and fungus. And so they look like all over the map when you're looking at isotope values, um, but they're essentially an omnivore uh, by virtue of sucking up those algae mats. 
So given that we know crayfish are omnivores, we think it's most likely that they're actually overlapping and acting a lot like the desert sucker. Um, and that that's most indicative of their diet. Um, and it seems like there's a high probability um, this directionality of crayfish overlapping with water scavenger beetles is really indicative of that first example I showed you where A had a lot of overlap with B, but B had little overlap with A. That's almost exactly what the niche overlap looked like for this, uh, this organism with crayfish. And so crayfish acted like a really small portion of this uh, population, but looked a lot like it. So it seems like they looked like the insectivore uh, segment of the water scavenger population. Um, and then this predaceous diving beetle, I think, is uh, a case of the, the orange fish, blue fish, where these, these things are eating a lot of fives, but the crayfish are eating ones through nines and average out looking like, looking like the uh, predaceous diving beetle. So overall, we think crayfish look like um, omnivores that have a strong penchant for eating other insects. Okay, now I mentioned briefly that the water scavenger beetles were a really interesting organism, that they act like a generalist, po or a generalist population uh, full of specialists. Um, so this is really helpful follow-up question to understand what crayfish are doing, since we think they're broadly omnivorous and vertebrate generalists here. Are they acting like a broadly indiscriminate uh, population of omnivores, or are individuals acting kind of like that uh, the water scavenger beetle, where there's specialists, individual, uh, individual specialists in the population. Now, I, I know that kind of sounds like semantics, but it has important conservation uh, and ecological ramifications. So I'm gonna briefly explain sort of what I'm talking about here. A generalist population of individual generalists, um, take a step back, sorry, orient you to what I'm gonna talk about on this slide. So I'm gonna show you three, three make-believe populations uh, here. The overall population niche will be represented by these black circles, and individuals in the population will be represented by these thin colored circles. And we'll have different organisms that uh, the crayfish could be eating in isotope space here. Um, so it's important to remember you are what you eat, and an organism's stable isotope signature is the average of the isotopes it's incorporated into its tissues from its diet, and that the population signature is the average of those individuals, right? Okay. So the first made up population that we'll look at here is a generalist population of generalists. So the whole population can feed on a variety of resources and they're doing it in roughly equal proportions to each other. So in this pretend population, every individual is eating all the critters in roughly equal proportions. So the overall population niche is, is relatively similar to the component individual niche uh, and there's moderate niche size and there's low to moderate variation of that niche size in the population. In contrast, a generalist population of individual specialists is where the individuals in the population have a really strong preference and feed on different resources from each other. In this pretend population, every individual is specializing on one of the critters, so the overall population niche, look, niche looks broad and it's highly variable, uh, and that's due to all the individual component niches being so uh, distinct. Uh, lastly, a population could be a true specialist, and that would be comprised of individuals all consuming the exact same single resource. And so in this uh, scenario, the individual's niche is virtually identical to the overall population niche, which is small and not variable. So if we want to apply this to our system, uh, uh, the best way to answer this kind of question is to sample a tissue from members of a population repeatedly through time. Um, I didn't do this. This is something of a post hoc question and post hoc analysis. Um, so given that, we uh, came up with a, a creative workaround that I think is a, um, we're able to pretty effectively make strong inference about uh, how crayfish are behaving. And that's by comparing their niche uh, size and variance to the uh, niche size and variance of known, uh, uh, the known ecologies of populations in our system. So we expect that generous populations of individual specialists would have high niche uh, volume and var high variance around that mean. We expect that the generalist population of generalists would have a more moderate niche size and low to moderate variation. And that an individual population or a specialist population of, of specialists will have low variation and low niche volume. So one of the easiest to interpret plots I've ever created in my life here is the analysis here is do crayfish look like one of these uh, populations? And indeed they do. They look a lot like the generalist population of individual generalists. Um, this is uh, Agosia chrysogaster, the long pin dace. Uh, 
and um, crayfish have uh, really small niche volumes relative to theirs um, and uh, a really similar uh, variation around that meat. Okay, so uh, to sum up quickly the food web conclusions. Um, there was no difference in the overall dietary niche of crayfish due to sex, uh, age or sex, which is good news from a conservation management standpoint and good news from our ability to, to interpret our data. Um, and there are some interesting follow-up studies that uh, could be done regarding some seasonal differences that we saw and uh, looking at the ontogenetic increase in hydrogen uh, a little further. Uh, crayfish appear to be omnivorous generalists and they appear to overlap strongly with predaceous diving beetles. But since we know crayfish are omnivore, that doesn't seem like a likely scenario. Um, and since they are generalist population and generalists, um, I take that to mean that their impacts on the community as a whole are likely softened or muted and less acute than it could be if the alternative were true. Um, and I, for the sake of time, I'm not going to dive into that too much now, but I'd really love to chat about that uh, if you are interested in what I mean by that. Uh, if we have time at the end, or if you want to follow up with me in an email later, please feel free to do so. Okay, moving on to the next study. Uh, we should know that very likely uh, consume uh, a lot of different resources of the Tularosa, but definitely are consuming a lot of invertebrates. Um, and we assumed that, that would be the case uh, from the get-go based on other literature. So in this next study, we wanted to know whether impacts, uh, whether this, uh, uh, predation impacts the movement of energy from the stream to terrestrial consumers. And we'll look at that by proxy of emergent invertebrate abundance. Um, so I'll briefly discuss what lateral subsidies are here. There, this is the movement of materials, uh, that is energy, between adjacent food webs that would be otherwise uh, compartmentalized. So this diagram shows the, the direction, uh, a subsidy in the direction from the stream to the riparian. This direction uh, subsidy definitely goes in both directions. Um, but here for the study, we're concerned with whether crayfish are severing the outward movement here. Um, the insects pictured here grow from in-stream resources. They emerge to complete the mating stage of their life uh, cycle, and then they're consumed en masse by terrestrial consumers. The big takeaway is that terrestrial consumers rely heavily on these aquatic secondary uh, uh, production subsidies. And consumers up to 17 kilometers away uh, for instance, will have midges as an important component of their diet. Um, I've highlighted here three uh, important sources of secondary production that we'll look at in this study, just to keep in mind. Midges, caddisflies, and mayflies. These are important worldwide, and they, uh, sure enough, are very important uh, in the Colorado River Basin as well. Now, in most ecosystems, the in-stream primary production uh, is low because sunlight is largely blocked by dense canopies. So the riparian to stream subsidy is a really important subsidy in those systems. The secondary produ production, um, that's the invertebrates, cons primary uh, consuming invertebrates in the stream, it's been taking them a lot of time to convert the more recalcitrant terrestrial plant material back into energy that will then subsidize riparian consumers uh, in return. By contrast, desert streams have a lot more access to light, and so their primary production subsidies uh, from adjacent watershed areas are lower. Uh, the in-stream primary production then is much higher in these streams and it can be converted to secondary production more quickly because they don't have as many uh, structural polysaccharides. So they have a lot more digestible uh, components to them. And that creates a really valuable and fast subsidy to riparian consumers in deserts. So the big question here is, do crayfish sever that lateral subsidy from the aquatic to the riparian in the Southwest uh, food webs? Um, these are this is an emergence trap here. This is a fantastic way to measure the lateral subsidy from stream to riparian. Um, all these that you see here were built by me in my living room. I want to again apologize to my partner Alicia for the mess that was in there for months and months while I was getting ready for the field season. Uh, these mesh covered floating pyramids uh, go over the stream as uh, insects come out. They only have one place to go, which is into my jar filled with ethanol where they sample themselves. Then we take this jar, put it in the freezer and pay an undergrad to uh, count up all of these bugs the following semester. Uh, I just want to note that the structure around the mesocosm or around the, the food, the emergence trap uh, is a mesocosm that has nothing to do with the, the emergence trap itself. Um, and we'll talk about the mesocosms a little bit more in just a second. So to answer our questions here, we conducted a 12 week in-stream mesocosm experiment that we paired with reach level uh, crayfish manipulations. Um, 
So we had two reaches, a removal reach here, where we uh, removed every single crayfish that we caught for four months in 2020 and for four months again in 2021. Uh, the mesocosms were uh, originally slated to be placed randomly throughout the stream in 2021. That quickly proved unfeasible. So the spacing that you see here uh, represents us cherry picking sites where the, the mesocosms could actually sit in situ without eroding uh, or getting moved out of, out of place. Um, we stocked units with either zero uh, crayfish, uh, three crayfish, or 10 crayfish uh, with six uh, replicates for each treatment. And we collected emergence trap samples every four weeks starting from the uh, inception of the project until the end. So you might have missed it, but I placed a rather subtle X over my experimental design. Uh, this is the first instance of the ecology gods smiting my study. Um, you might have also noticed that there is a juvenile crayfish sample uh, sampling event, which was not in my original study design. Um, we had an invasion of crayfish um, sometime between the second and third sampling event. Uh, it seems like the small early instar uh, free swimming uh, uh, instars of crayfish were able to fit through the eighth inch mesh. And so they were either either born in the mesocosm or migrated there uh, en masse uh, for a few days when they were able to before they were too big. So uh, rolling with the punches, we, instead of using uh, our, uh, our treatments uh, as our predictor variables, we switched to using crayfish density. Uh, we recovered crayfish from each mesocosm at the end um, and either hand collected the adult crayfish or conducted 10 dip net sweeps in every single mesocosm to get a standardized uh, estimate of the young of year that had invaded the mesocosm, estimated the rye mass um, and came up with this continuous variable instead. Excuse me. We spent a few weeks in February and March troubleshooting uh, the installations um, and uh, the installations went like this. We took uh, about the sod from the margin of the stream and uh, took the sediment out as well in five gallon buckets, reserved it to re-inoculate uh, the, uh, the mesocosm. So we took that sod and re-inoculated the uh, interior third uh, uh, edge with that and then replace all of the other sediment into here, let these sit for about a week before we kicked off the experiment. Um, I just want to, here's a, a mesocosm fully installed. Uh, we had them anchored down so they wouldn't blow out. And we had these, uh, this mosquito netting over the top, both to prevent crayfish from escaping and to discourage terrestrial uh, consumers from predating upon our crayfish. There's eighth inch hardware cloth all the way around. That's to prevent um, incidental mortalities of narrow-headed garter snake and uh, loach minnow at the site, which are both federally protected species. Uh, and I wanna make sure I thank Jeff uh, Carpenter from Herptech Metalworks who helped me design and build uh, all of these mesocosms and it really worked out fantastically. So thank you, Jeff. Okay, with no further ado, uh, these next several plots where we'll be looking at the total insect emergence for four different taxa with uh, the mass of recovered crayfish uh, on the x-axis here. Um, we compared the total mass of crayfish uh, to the total number of insects and fitted this to a linear model. In every case, we see there's negative trend. Um, uh, and only one case was at a significant, uh, a significant negative relationship. Uh, in every case though, when there were more crayfish at a location in a mesocosm, uh, there were fewer insects that emerged out of the water. Okay, I just wanna point out that anecdotally, it seems like there might be a density threshold when we're just looking at this data, just visual analysis. And this is something we wanna do in the future, um, uh, either a subsequent study or to figure out a more refined analysis where we can look at and see if we can find a density threshold of these crayfish, because it seems like that might exist. And that would be a really important uh, piece of information for management folks. Um, but for now, it's just kind of speculative. Another speculative thing uh, worth noting is that the high densities of crayfish in the mesocosms, there was always a noticeable lack of vegetation, which definitely compounded the effect of emergence abundance um, and low and zero density treatments all appeared equally unaffected. Okay, I briefly want to touch on the in-stream crayfish density manipulation. So here we have the total crayfish that we captured. This is both years combined. Uh, for simplicity's sake, we used 100 minnow traps in a 550 meter red, uh, reach. We trapped for four nights a week, every other week for four months. Uh, 
2021, we also added dip net surveys and electrofishing surveys in the intervening weeks. And we ended up removing about 7,500 crayfish total. Uh, and most of that was in 2021. Um, and so you can see that here in 2020, there were far fewer crayfish, especially until reproduction kicked off. Two main things I wanna note here. Um, the, that despite removing all the crayfish that were removed from a really short reach of 275 meter reach, the effect on density was not very large or pronounced. Um, second, the variation within each reach was actually much greater than the differences between the reaches. So instead of using reach as an explanatory variable, we used the average density of crayfish in nearby uh, traps to the emergence trap where the invertebrate data was collected. Okay, I also wanna point out, uh, I tried really hard to keep my volunteers well fed. Um, and I, in all seriousness, I want to point out crayfish are really good eating. And I think encouraging their recreational consumption could be a really good additional low cost conservation approach. I know there's probably a lot of caveats and difficulties in implementing something like that, but I just want to throw out there bringing crawdad boils to the Southwest could be useful. Okay, so here again, we're looking at really similar plots. We have these same four invertebrate taxa that were the uh, uh, most abundant uh, response variables. Uh, their abundance on the y-axis and crayfish abundance on the x-axis. We can uh, we see again that the total insect abundance decreases with crayfish density in every case, but there's really clearly a big difference between 2020 and 2021 samples. So we looked at those individually, and sure enough, we see a positive or neutral uh, correlation between invertebrate abundance increasing with crayfish abundance when crayfish abundance is low, um, and in every case, a negative or neutral relationship when that crayfish abundance was really high. Um, so this is a little more, uh, uh, well, it's hard to say too much about this because there's a lot of other variables that could influence this result, right? But one thing is for sure that there was a lot of emergent insects in 2020 and not very many crayfish. And in 2021, there were a lot of crayfish and not nearly as many uh, emerging invertebrates. So there's something to this we think can definitely uh, merits further exploration of that density threshold. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm gonna blow through this uh, last part pretty quickly. Um, landscape scale associations between crayfish and aquatic organisms, last thing we wanna look at. Um, so again, we were looking at a long-term data set collected by Keith, Tom, Dave, and a bunch of other collaborators. Uh, this data set spans actually 12 sites uh, and they collected fish, aquatic invertebrates, and crayfish for uh, uh, nine or 10 years. For this talk, I've uh, looked at a subset of these sites that had the longest time span, um, most contiguous time span. Um, two of them are tributaries from higher elevation. Um, and um, uh, two are from uh, more uh, canyon bound middle elevation sites and two are from lower elevation valley sites, which consistently had the highest number of crayfish uh, and non-native fish abundances as well. So I'll be showing you data from pre and post monsoon sampling trips and focusing on the insects communities, but we also uh, uh, have parallel analyses uh, looking at fish communities uh, in, this, in this project. So the first question is, do crayfish affect overall invertebrate community structure? Uh, to do this, we will have uh, a series of plots here on the x-axis, we'll have crayfish abundance every time. On the y-axis will be three different community structure um, uh, uh, surrogate. So here we have family richness, which is just the number of families found at the site. We predicted that we might, based on what we know about crayfish, that there might be some local, local extirpations and that reach, richness would decrease. Uh, surprisingly, we found a slight upward trend, non-significant, uh, although the, the effect size is really small and it wasn't very well supported. Um, for this and the next two plots, I want to mention that we ran a model selection test to see if the site groups or if season explained the variation we saw in the community structure. But in all three cases, the best model only included crayfish abundance and ended up being a, a very noisy data set. Um, okay, so here we're looking at Simpson's evenness index on the y-axis. Um, this is an index that scores uh, from zero to one uh, with high evenness scoring uh, near one, and that indicates equal abundances across all the taxa at the site, and a low score indicating one or few a few dominant taxa at the site. We expected that a crayfish were indiscriminate feeders that they would by random chance, uh, sort of optimal foraging theory, they would be eating the more common species more often and that might create a more even invertebrate community. Uh, and it looks like we're 0 for 2 so far because we found a negative trend with this one. Um, 
this indicates that there might be some winners and losers with crayfish uh, presence at a site. Um, but again, this was not a very uh, significant or strong uh, trend. Lastly, we'll look at Shannon Diversity Index, which is sort of a mix of those last two. It takes into account species richness and the relative abundance. High diversity score means high richness and high evenness. Low diversity score means low richness and or low evenness at site. Uh, based on our previous results, we thought that those would sort of meter out and we ended up with a fairly unchanged uh, diversity score uh, just by virtue of averaging out the negative evenness and positive richness that we observed. Um, and so one out of three ain't bad. We found that there was not much of a difference in family diversity with increasing crayfish abundance. And again, a very noisy data set. We're looking at uh, you know nine years across uh, six different sites. Okay, last question here. Uh, we chose to look at three invertebrate taxa that were most important from the mesocosm experiment that we talked about earlier. Those are midges, caddisflies, and mayflies. And uh, simply put, we just want to look at their abundance uh, and related to crayfish abundance. So uh, we saw a huge uh, range in abundance in both of these species. So we log transformed both. Um, and uh, we separated out, we found that the season was an important predictor uh, in this model. So we included season uh, in every case here. Uh, first thing you'll notice about all these plots is again, they're very noisy. Uh, seasonal precipitation and other factors are really important drivers of invert abundance and aquatic communities in general uh, contribute a lot to the variation. So getting any signal at all from crayfish is a really significant uh, finding in its own right. Um, so the first super interesting thing is that here we see a positive relationship between crayfish and chironomids, uh, which was very surprising and important because chironomids are one of the most important uh, invertebrates in a stream as far as that lateral subsidy uh, for um, and for aquatic uh, consumers as well. Uh, caddisflies, uh, we also saw a positive relationship with caddisflies and crayfish. Um, and lastly, we saw um, a positive trend with uh, mayflies and crayfish. So uh, I want to make sure we give some caveats to this last study here a little bit. Uh, the answer is nuanced. While we saw some trends, it's important to remember that the raw statistical results with what we know about the system, it's a really variable system. We've had fires in this time, mega wildfires, and huge floods subsequent to that. And uh, we know that we have huge seasonal precipitation uh, is a really important factor and that can sometimes be hit or miss um, in the 10 year span that we were looking at this, at this data. So given the noise in this really complex data set, the most we can really say is that we didn't find a smoking gun about crayfish um, uh, negative impacts uh, here. They weren't exactly vindicated, uh, I would say, but we also don't see really strong negative correlations, which is interesting. Um, as for the relationships with the individual taxa, we only ever observed positive or neutral relationships. I only showed you three, but we did this for every taxa that was found, which was a lot. There was something like 54 taxa that was abundant enough in every site across the years to run these analyses on. And in every case, they were either neutral or a positive correlation with crayfish. Um, now, it's hard to say again too much about this. It could mean that crayfish somehow facilitate good conditions for those taxa through predatory release or bioturbation or some other mechanism. Um, or it could just mean that crayfish, uh, a good year for crayfish is a good year for those taxa too. And it could just be a completely um, uh, chance occurrence, right? Okay. And so I just want to bring it all home by reemphasizing that my study here was aimed at understanding the collective impact of crayfish at uh, different densities of crayfish populations. That the impacts of individuals, they might, uh, crayfish might opportunistically, they do opportunistically predate upon larger species that the population as a whole does not readily consume. And that uh, that effect on its own could be devastating to some really sensitive species uh, if the crayfish population density is high. It's just a numbers game. The more crayfish there are, then the higher chances that some crayfish are eating some narrow-headed garter snakes or some uh, chub or some, uh, you know, some sensitive species we care about. Um, but again, knowing that crayfish can't be eradicated, um, understanding that we might be able to suppress their densities in critical habitats that we're really concerned about their effects to mitigate the effects of the individual and the collective, I think is really important knowledge and a really important thing to consider moving forward. Um, we think that paired with some of the really good occupancy modeling that's been coming out of this group uh, uh, from UT San Antonio uh, with Matt Troya and them, I think that could be a really important toolkit for managers moving forward to identify where crayfish densities are highest, uh, 
and uh, and to have more targeted, more efficient, uh, and high bang for your buck efforts. And I think maybe there's a little bit of a glimmer of hope uh, in conservation moving forward from that. Um, just as a really brief anecdote, uh, in my undergrad work and my dissertation work, I've handled a lot, tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of crayfish. Um, I've only ever observed a crayfish predating a vertebrate once when this Arizona toad was uh, pinned to the bottom of the stream by a crayfish. And I just wanna point this out to underscore the rarity of an event like this. Uh, but while it's rare, it does happen. The more crayfish there are, the more it happens and the more it can substantially impact a, a sensitive population. So I think when possible, uh, agencies should be encouraging their current fisheries folks to collect crayfish uh, data, just length, sex of crayfish and numbers of crayfish, right? That Just that information could be really, really important. Um, and it's not currently being collected to my knowledge by the majority of people out there that could be collecting it. Um, so I'd really encourage that to start happening. Um, crayfish role in the ecosystem seems to be mostly an unoccupied niche with lots of flexibility. As a generalist population of generalists, this is potentially good news because their impacts might be blunted by virtue of preferentially feeding on the more abundant resources in any given year. And they, they can move around and instead of, of being sort of a death knell uh, to some sensitive species, uh, it could be that it just sort of modulate and, and help regulate uh, what's otherwise a very, a very um, stochastic system, right? Um, I think we can safely say that at low densities, crayfish appear to be neutral, if not beneficial members of the community from our data. Um, and of course, a low density population has the potential to explode the next year. So it could make for tricky calls from a management perspective, right? But um, uh, lastly, I just want to make sure everybody feels free to reach out to me or Tom if you have any questions about uh, applying our results to crayfish management. Um, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but we've thought about crayfish quite a bit, and we're both very passionate about data-driven -dri management. Uh, we feel it's crucial to effective outcomes, and, and we're happy to help as we can. So with that, uh, I'll leave this up uh, and make sure you guys can see all the people who have helped out tremendously with this project. I really appreciate everybody. Um, and for the sake of time, I'll open it up to questions now, I think. That was great. Thank you, Gregor. Um, you did a ton of really awesome work. Um, so thank you for presenting that to us today. Um, I'll start. We have one question from the chat um, that I think from Tom to Tom um, <laughs> might be answering, but I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> Um, among your landscape analyses, how does the length of time that crayfish occupied those sites affect your results with respect to effects on the invert community? That is, would the results be different if you looked at those communities prior to crayfish colonization? Tom, do you want to jump in or do you want me to field this? Well, uh, let's see. Let me get my camera on here. Um, yeah, so I thought of two things. One is we could get, we could look at you know, the long-term data set, which goes back to about 30 years, uh, the day probes started collecting back in the late 80s, I think, and, and to see, uh, you know, if there's a differential uh, appearance there. And, but the question is really interesting because, you know, we're only observing this ecosystem post-invasion, right? And so there could have been fundamental changes that happened right at the outset. That's going to be hard to kind of tackle, but it is a really important question. So, um, uh, Gregor, if you've got any more insight on that, um, yeah, I think I, I think one thing I've thought about doing, and I'm just not as well versed with these analyses, and it's something I'd like to do in the future with this data set, especially, is is some lag analyses uh, because I think the crayfish abundance peaking in one year might not have might not play out right away, um, and this isn't exactly what you're asking, Tom. I, I don't think, but um, I think that that would be important. Another thing is that, man, I'd love to just be planted at a site that currently doesn't have any crayfish and just get a long-term study started, hoping that crayfish <laughs> invade the system in a, a masochistic way. Um, because I think that'd be really cool to get before and after. And it's, it's hard to figure out a way to do that, I think. So thank you. Um, Another question, how much involvement have you had with tribes? Any issues or concerns of crayfish on tribal lands? I have not had uh, any. I 
all of my study was was located at one site except for the that long term data set, which uh, uh, were most of Dave Dave Probe's long term sites. Um, so I don't I don't know the answer to that question. But that's a good question. I'm sure, White Mountain has plenty that they're worried about. All right. Um, we have time for maybe one more question if anyone has one. At this point, feel free to, to unmute and ask if that's easier. Right. Would you be interested in presenting um, at the, I don't know if this stands for, um, Native American Fish and Wildlife Service Southwest Region would be my guess, uh, conference this year. Yeah. Maybe, um, might be worth Ma putting maybe uh, emails in the chat. Yeah, I'll um, do it now. To facilitate that. Yeah, great. Perfect. Um, all right. Well, with that, I guess it will go ahead and close us out. Um, so thank you everyone for coming today. As you know, this webinar was recorded and will be on our YouTube channel probably within the next couple of days. Um, you can also find all of our previous webinars there. And Carly just put the link along with a couple others in the chat. Thank you, Carly. Um, we also have 181 published case studies um, that you can check out. Our next webinar is going to be on May 23rd given by Jason Goldberg from Fish and Wildlife Service and Amanda Dieblishauer at Old Dominion University, who will be speaking about something you brought up, Gregor, um, about invasivorism or eating invasive species to mm. control populations. Um, so if you aren't already on our mailing list and you want to see receive these announcements and webinar invites, uh, just let us know and we'll get you on there. So thank you everyone again, um, especially to you, Gregor, for giving this excellent presentation today, and we will see all of you soon.